Howdy guys, how are you guys doing? I'm doing great, honestly. Um, I did a couple of reactions. First of all, let's talk about the design. Do you guys like this new uh, layout? Uh, I, I really like this one. Uh, the reaction uh, would be just this one. You know, it looks very simple. Here you can just add the, the donation, the subs, you know, all that. But that's for Twitch, that's not for YouTube. So uh, tell me, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try using this one today. And, and tell me just how uh, how do you like this anyways uh, let's just stop talking and let's actually do the actual reaction of the video which is this one the Mexican American border manifest destinies uh, you know we left where the countries were independent and we learned a lot about the first of all this guy Kraut uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly but goddamn he is a genius I really enjoy the previous uh, part, and I guess this is the second part. Uh, this was uploaded uh, some a couple months later than the last video, so uh, hopefully I'm doing the the correct reaction. All right, but I guess this is gonna be also really interesting. I think uh, I'm gonna go with this one for now, right? Just the old design, just for this video. Chapter five. To manifest destinies. Or three. Huh. I don't know. The 1800s were a century of American expansion, collectively known under the term manifest Yeah, destiny. let's go. A 19th century socio political movement originating in New England. Its main claim being that the United States had an obligation to expand across the entire North American continent to spread its way of life and social structure. We associate this term mainly with the time period of the 1840s, when starting from New England, more and more American settlers pushed westward to settle. You know, this is one of the things that a lot of people don't really understand about the U.S. history. Uh, a lot of would you do learn this about in school in Mexico, uh, but everyone I, I and i really really remember this uh everyone is like what like why did the u.s just sort of felt like they had to uh occupy all that land like yeah you wanted to expand but why it's really hard to understand a little bit the why the mexican-american war took place as well as the american annexations of mexican territory north of the rio grande and the american wars with natives flared up as the u.s government enforced the program of ethnic cleansing however i find this to oversimplify Jesus. the story of american expansion westward when the story of manifest destiny is told particularly in popular history it is often done in a way that can make people think this was the one big and only expansion of territory by the americans or that american territory didn't expand before or that american expansionism only came from New England and that is simply not true from the first moment of settlers arriving on the coastlines of North America there had been expansions westward the British had even banned further expansion to keep treaties with the Cherokee but after the British were gone there was nothing holding the Americans back after the founding of the first settlements there were 11 big internal expansions through migrations by settlers into <laughs> frontier countries in North America one of the first was Appalachia. When Britain exported Scots and Scottish penal labor into the New World, these didn't like sticking around the predominantly English colonies, so they ran off into the then hard-to-reach frontier of the Appalachian Mountains, founding their own settlements, towns, and social structures that would become the modern-day states of West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Wow. As soon as the British were gone, there were three big migrations westward between 1780 and 1840. From New England, settlers pushed westward from upstate New York along the Great Lakes, bringing with them their social structures in attempts to expand their way of life and society westward. Ships right. carrying these settlers along the Great Lakes had names like the Mayflower of the West, and they would chase away the Iroquois to found new settlements along northern Pennsylvania, northern Ohio, northern Indiana, and northern Illinois, northern Wisconsin, and basically the entire state of Michigan. <laughs> you can see when New Englanders settled in places like the Ohio Valley by the names given to these towns that often resemble the names of towns in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York, or even Old World England itself, like Bristol, Danbury, Fairfield, Greenwich, Guildford, Hartford, Lichfield, New Haven, New London, or Norwalk. Fourth, yeah. the earliest... Yeah, that, that, that sounds very, very British, yeah. 
European settlers of Appalachia tended to live in small farms and drive the herds of pigs, sheep and cattle from field to field until the soil had been depleted. Then they abandoned that farm, moved to the next patch of land and started over again. Starting in the 1800s, these Appalachians hmm. started to quickly All expand right. westward from the mountains into the Ohio Valley and down the Mississippi Valley. They spread and settled in the south in northern Georgia, northern Alabama, and northern Mississippi, north into southern Ohio, southern Indiana, and southern Illinois, and west into Iowa, Missouri, Canada. Okay, so here is my prediction, all right? And I don't know if I'm going to be right. I think we're going to talk, and this is really interesting because I really like this point of, of history for both the U.S. and Mexico. This is my favorite period of time. Uh, of history, right? Between the 1800s and the 1900s, because that's where, when stuff happens, really. I mean, you look at America from the 1800s and Mexico from the uh, 1800s, and then America from the 1900s and Mexico from the 1900s, and it's just completely different countries. Answers are so uh, we're going to get uh, into our Manifest Destiny and how it affected the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico, maybe get into the Mexican-American War. Uh, and that's why we're learning about the early European expansions, right? I'm, I'm guessing. And by the 1840s into northern Texas, natives, be they Cherokee, Chickasaw, or whoever the Appalachians encountered, were driven off to make way, creating a large cultural <laughs> sphere of states whose inhabitants some today just call redneck. Fifth, from 1810 onward, Europe was a tinderbox of constantly flaring revolutionary flames. One place where these fires kept flaring up over and over again Germany. was Germany. However, all revolutions that flared up in Germany failed, including the big one in 1848. With absolute monarchy ever deeply entrenching itself in Germany, tens of thousands of disillusioned Germans from Prussia to Poland to the Rhineland, Bavaria, Czechia and Austria packed and left for America starting in the 1820s. And they were encouraged to do so by German governments glad to rid themselves of potential troublemakers. These Germans would usually migrate east of Philadelphia throughout western Pennsylvania and central Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, right. Minnesota and Wisconsin. They brought with them their social structure of semi-independent small family-owned farms and family businesses and created the cultural framework for what became the Midwest. You can see the impact these first free westward yep. migrations. Usually, uh, if you don't know, I am a sommelier, so I am a wine expert. Uh, but I, we also learned a lot about beer and the reason why in the Midwest or places like Illinois, Wisconsin especially, you know, uh, the beer of those, those places has huge German influence and, and the beer from those states has huge German influence and you can try it yourself. And if you've been and, and if you're from Wisconsin or if you're from, um, you know, maybe Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, you'll tell me. Uh, but the influence is particularly strong in Wisconsin had in modern you know, politics to this a, day. A the coastlines of the Great Lakes, mainly settled by people from New England, tend to vote Democratic. The southern parts, mainly settled by Appalachians, tend to vote Republican. And the parts settled by Germans can vote both ways and are what make these places swing in elections. Sixth, by the 1810s, the nice. slave lords of the South ran into a problem. They had run out of land to expand their plantations. New England politicians had constantly blocked any attempt by southern states to expand slavery westward. But by the 1820s, they gained the political power to expand west. And by 1829, had a president in the White House who was sympathetic to their cause. The Cherokee, Creek, and Choctaw were driven off their lands with the not so subtly named Indian Removal Act <laughs> to make way for southern slave plantations in Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi. And when these plantation owners expanded into Louisiana, they encountered and were disgusted by the local colonial French towns where over 50% of all blacks were free, where free black Frenchmen <laughs> could rise to a high social status and where interracial marriages had never been illegal and were widely practiced. So uh -huh. they forced their way of life upon them from this point onward. What we see here with this southern westward expansion is that westward expansion not only meant the removal it's, it's so interesting. but also the removal and forcing yourself upon other colonial European societies. With this southern expansion, oh, okay. we reach the 1840s, where in popular history, many claim that the era of Manifest Destiny began. As you clearly saw, the push westward happened more than half a century before, Way early, even under yeah. British colonial rule. And more importantly, I left out the first expansions of settlements, one that is often ignored, overlooked, or forgotten in the story of North America, the Spanish and later Mexican push north. 
the Spanish settlers who settled from California to Texas yeah. and founded a distinctive culture. Decades that is true. Uh, if I am not mistaken, and I think I'm not, uh, uh, the Mexican government really wanted uh, to send population up north. And they were basically doing the exact same thing. Uh, because, you know, you have a bunch of land, but it, you're not using that land. You know, it's just land, but it has no people, so there was no one to work that land. And, you know, it also there's also not a lot of people to defend that land. So, uh, in Mexican, the Mexican government was really, really, really wanted to send people up north. That's why they allowed American colonists on the first place. Because uh, there was no one to work the land, so they were like, "Okay, we can s allow some Americans so they can work the land, and you know, maybe you know, it'd be financially good for us." Uh, you know, at the end it wasn't, but yeah, they were trying to do the same thing. Uh, you know, they had their own manifest destiny before American expansions. 1776 is widely remembered as the year the American Revolution began. But we should not forget that 1776 is also the same year that the Spanish founded San Francisco. Here lies probably one of the main reasons why the year 1840 is so significant to what Americans call Manifest Destiny, because it collided with someone else's destiny. Of course, previous expansions had collided with the destinies of many peoples, Cherokee, Iroquois, Creek, Choctaw, and many more, a people defined as savage and unworthy of the land they lived upon by those who came to take it away from them. But west of Oklahoma and the Sabine River, there now was another European nation and culture, a nation that had expanded north, had itself taken land from the Apaches, Huatiltecan, Pueblo, Navajo, and Comash. Yeah, and uh, we also had worse with a lot of the, the the Indian tribes that are now located in, in America, but at that time they were located in Mexico and the Mexican army and government had conflicts with the Navajo. And this is something we don't really learn in school, uh, you know, because I guess the territory was lost. So you don't really get to learn about what happened in Arizona or New Mexico. But yeah, the Mexican government fought uh, Indians now located in the US. A nation that saw it as its own manifest destiny to go north and to expand, build and prosper yep, that as is a society. True. Expanding westward now meant clashing with another European state society and with a different vision of society. It would no longer just be a drive to grab and take from peoples considered inferior, but a contest with a state over which one was more worthy oh, or strong oh. enough to take these lands. In many ways, a common theme of imperialism during that era, when Britain challenged the Mughals for rule over India and France challenged the Ottomans for rule over North Africa at the same time. Conflict between Mexico and America over these lands would mean an imperial war of expansion. However, there's also an additional reason why 1840 stands out to us, and that has to do with the internal politics of both these places at the time. Yeah. In the United States, the two predominant political forces at the time were those of the New England North with its Midwest ally and the South with its Appalachian ally, fighting over the one preeminent political issue of the time, slavery. It was not just New England that expanded West, but also the South, and they did so for the same reason, to form free states and slave states, to have more states than the other, to dominate over the other, to either abolish slavery or reinforce and expand slavery. A political confrontation that eventually yep. blew up into a full-blown civil war. Here, in the context of this internal political conflict and encountering Mexico, is where the ninth and 10th big migration waves came into the picture. In the north, people from the Midwest and New England migrated into Oregon and California, intending to build a New England of the West Coast. The native Chinook people of Oregon, when first encountering white people, started calling them Bostoners because so many settlers came from Boston. The names of their settlements, such as Salem, named after a town of the same name in Massachusetts, or Portland, named after a town of the same name in Maine, clearly show how these first American settlers in Oregon and California were from New England. 
However, in California, they were unclaimed land and needed a justification for violating the Spanish and later Mexican claims, which the Protestant New Englanders did by declaring the migrations there as a war against the Popish Catholic tyranny of Spain oh. and to bring the true virtuous Protestant faith to these lands. Damn, Early damn. American settlers in California converted to Catholicism and adopted Mexican citizenship. But as the decades rolled on, more and more New England settlers brought with them a refusal to adopt any such Thing. They started building public schools and Protestant churches. They lived in disobedience of the already weak state authority of the Californian state. And as the years went by, more and more openly claimed that California ought to be part of the United States. Yowch. And at the same time in Texas, southerners started to arrive with slaves to turn it into a slave state. As the large landowners, bankers, generals and mine owners kept bickering and scheming over the power and riches of the country in Mexico City and the authority of the state increasingly started to decline, the two places it lost the most control over were Alta California and Texas. The Nortenos increasingly lived their lives by themselves and gave less and less of a damn about what those bickering fools in Mexico City told them to do especially after caravans with supplies stopped being sent north from Mexico City. What was sent north by Mexico City was often counterproductive to asserting control, such as penal laborers who kept escaping, laws that discriminated religious minorities and groups such as the Franciscans, ordering them expelled from the country, which the governor of Alta California refused to enforce, and which couldn't really be enforced in Texas, where government authority didn't have much of a reach anymore. Mexican soldiers who were sent to Texas and California to secure it for Mexico City often stopped getting paid by Mexico City and even stopped receiving basic supplies and rations, which resulted in entire companies deserting and entire battalions marauding through the lands, sacking and pillaging missions, churches, ranches and towns. To top all that off, Mexico City passed a law that required a minimum annual income bracket for politicians. Congressmen had to have an annual income of at least 1,500 pesos to run for office. That's an annual income of $160,000 in today's money. Ooh. And governors needed to earn at least 2,000 pesos a year to run for office, which is an Damn. annual income of $220,000 Yo, in they know what's money. up, yeah. This law secured the power of the wealthy <laughs> elite in Mexico City, eliminated any public participation in politics, and ensured the country would remain an authoritarian an oligarchy. But in the north, this law turned into an outright farce because not a single person living in the lands stretching from the Bay of San Francisco to the Texas coastline earned enough money to be a governor, congressman, mayor, or even just a district deputy. In the north, nobody obeyed this law. People, in fact, stopped obeying most of Mexico City's laws. Mexico City and Mexico, by and large, started being seen as a nuisance and an obstruction in the lives of the Nortenos. Tejano ranchers illegally drove their herds of cattle and fine-bred horses across the border into markets in Louisiana. Californios smuggled and sold their cow hides illegally in markets on the U.S. frontier. Trading with foreigners was illegal, but nobody cared. And as the governor of California, Mariano Chico, noted, Necessity makes licit what is not licit by law. Without it, Californians would not exist. Hmm. As he had to admit that without breaking Mexico City's ridiculous laws, the economy and society of California would collapse into itself. Texas, in particular, increasingly slipped out of Mexico's control. Besides the fact that the Apaches didn't take kindly to anyone, Texas became increasingly pulled out of integration with Mexico. <laughs> Internal integration is the extent to which a state entity can exert control over a region through infrastructure, administration, law, and trade. If you are a country, the extent to which you control that country is dependent upon how well you can access each part of this country, how much you can enforce your laws over these lands, and how well trade internally can be facilitated. 
The Nortenos of Texas increasingly traded with the Americans. The road networks of the region had already been completely neglected, resulting in the roads and paths leading from Texas into Louisiana being better developed than those leading to Mexico City. Louisiana also had the nice big juicy port of New Orleans, through which Nortenos could not only sell their products into the wider world, but could also access American markets through the vast Mississippi shipping lanes. And he also didn't have to bribe any oligarchs to do business in the United States. Texas gradually started to slip into an increasingly American economic sphere of influence. Americans also increasingly moved into Texas. By 1823, 3,000 of them lived there illegally, about as much as the Norteno population. And the government in Mexico City saw that as a good thing. Moses and Stephen Austin, a father and son team, had bought large mm. land grants from the Mexican government right after. I guess uh, that's where the Texas capital gets its name. Independence, built a ranch and over decades learned Spanish, acquired citizenship oh, really? and encouraged other Americans to do as they had. Mexico City believed that wow. this would be the standard for American migration into Texas. They encouraged Americans to move to Texas, placed laws in effect that would demand of them to convert to Catholicism and expected that these American settlers would help tame the Nortenos and the Apaches and thereby restore control over Texas for Think Mexico again, City. Pal. They were however wrong. And this is also where myths started to be created. When you read popular history about what happened next, there are two versions of the story. The first is that a group of brave, pioneering Anglo-Americans liberated Texas for themselves. The other is that devious, white Anglo-Americans stole Texas from its Mexican inhabitants. Both narratives are wrong, one more wrong than the other. One is more self-limiting, both oversimplify what happened. There are two main groups of American settlers who came to Texas. Appalachian Hill and Mountain people who settled in northern Texas to build small, self-sufficient communities within which they wanted to be as far away from New England and the South, as well as their governments, laws and regulations as possible. And Southern much who settled along everyone. the Texas coastline who wanted to expand their slave plantations for profit and create a new slave state to expand. It's always so amazing to see that you, could, you can see the differences from this and you can look at a map of uh, ethnic heritage uh, to see the differences you know people's surname right in North Texas they might have more Scottish sounding names and they do they do have uh, and that's why I'm saying this because I've noticed it but I never really knew where it come from but now I know uh, and, and that's why East Texas has a very southern vibe while North Texas is a little bit different of course South Texas has a huge Hispanic vibe um, you know, I like Texas because uh, it's so diverse as a state, probably just as much as California, maybe some other places like Florida, New York. The political power in their rivalry with New England. However, the majority of settlers were southerners. These groups encountered and became neighbors of the Nortenos. But rather oh. than deeper tying the Nortenos into Mexico, the Americans and Nortenos found increasingly more common ground. They both mm, couldn't really? stand the authoritarianism and attempts by Mexico City to control their lives. Nortenos increasingly wished to liberate themselves from Mexico City's tyranny. The southerners were by and large failed slave plantation owners running away from creditors and debt collectors from Louisiana to South Carolina. They didn't bother learning Spanish, certainly didn't convert to Catholicism, <laughs> and imported slaves in violation of Mexico City's abolition of slavery. People like Hayden Edwards, who when he was reminded of Mexico's ban on slavery, declared himself independent in the Republic of Fredonia, where he legalized <laughs> slavery. The Mexican army deported him back to Louisiana, however, the tide could not be stopped. And so, Oops. in 1830, Mexico banned immigration. But Americans kept <laughs> coming and Nortenos supported them, Mexico as it brought built the wall. markets with which they were trading closer to them. Americans started outnumbering Nortenos by 10 to 1. But both groups were not in conflict, but unified in opposition and open defiance against Mexico City. The Mexican perspective here, especially of the Tejanos, is often overlooked. The conflict between the North and South kept boiling, and all it would take for it to blow up was a spark, which came in 1833. When Santa Ana became president of Mexico again in 1833, yeah, he guy? wanted to ensure that he would not be removed from power again. So he suspended the Mexican constitution, sent all his opponents into exile abroad, and seized complete power of all Mexican government institutions. 
Almost instantly, this led to rebellions all across Mexico, in Coahuila, Texas, New Mexico, and Alta California. California went so far as to declare independence, threatening to remain such until the Mexican constitution had been restored. Pueblo Indians in New Mexico rose up in revolt, took Santa Fe, killed the governor, and declared a mestizo wow. buffalo hunter to be their new governor. Santa Ana spent the first two years of this new presidency marching through northern Mexico with an army crushing one rebellion after another with increasing brutality. Tejanos, angered by the move into absolute dictatorship, the previous decades of neglect and authoritarianism, and by Santa Ana's increasing brutality, enough. had enough. They demanded at first for Texas to become a separate state from Coahuila, but to still remain part of Mexico. But support for that increasingly dissipated, and leading Nortenos, such as Juan Seguin, a friend of Stephen Austin, and Lorenzo de Zavala, Stephen joined forces Austin. with separatist American settlers to demand complete independence from Mexico. At the Battle of the Alamo, 12 Tejanos were amongst the 200 fighting for an independent Texas. Lorenzo de Zavala would become the first vice president of Texas. Juan hmm. Seguin would lead Tejano rebels at the Battle of San Jacinto, the deciding battle that's just really interesting and maybe even weird for to, to hear this, but yeah, te the founding of Texas, um, the Republic of Texas was a joint effort with Americans and Mexicans and, and I didn't knew the first Texas vice president was actually Me Mexican or Tejano, you know, uh, Mexican from Texas, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Texas is a result of joint cooperation and, um, and Texas is a state that I really like in the US. I don't know if it's my favorite state. I don't know if I would call it like that. You know, there's uh, other 49 contestants that are very good, but uh, but it's a great place to be and I, maybe I feel very comfortable because I, we, I feel very comfortable with both with Mexican and American cultures and Texas is just kind of like that blend. I don't know I don't know how you feel about the whole thing but that's how I, I secured Texan independence and administered the burial of the dead after it. But it was already during the war where a myth started to be created. Southern newspapers reported on this war as a conflict between white Anglo-Americans no. in a war against an inferior mixed Hispanic race Ouch. and their tyranny. Stephen Austin called the war a war of barbarism and despotic principles waged by the mongrel Spanish Indian and Negro race against civilization and the Anglo-American race. <coughs> All of it lies through and through. Tejanos Such. had risen up side by side with American settlers as Texans, yeah, okay. primarily against Santa Ana's dictatorship. And when the revolution was over, the Nortenos who had rebelled against Mexico City were betrayed. Southerners flooded into Texas to build new slave plantations along the coast, and the Nortenos who had lived there were dispossessed and driven off the land. Juan Seguin, who was elected the mayor of San Antonio in an independent Texas, was sent into exile after a rabble of southern newcomers accused him of being a Mexican spy. He returned years huh? later after being proven innocent to discover in anger how Texas had been turned into a racially segregated society, with the Nortenos restricted to the lands along the Rio Grande, and where none of them could hope to achieve any political representation or power within this new state. At every hour of the day and night, my countrymen ran to me for protection against the assaults or exaction of those adventurers. Sometimes, by persuasion, I prevailed on them to desist. Sometimes, also, force had to be resorted to. How could I have done otherwise? Could I leave them defenseless, exposed to the assaults by foreigners who were on the pretext that they were Mexicans, treated them worse than brutes? Wow. A powerful myth was born from these events, which became accepted historical fact for almost a century. A tale of brave southern pioneers who settled a land and freed it from Latin despotism. A tale that removed the story of the Norteno completely. And perplexingly, as we changed the way we tell history in the mid-20th century, a new counter-myth that called itself progressive was born, but was just as mythical. A tale of devious southern slave owners who stole the lands of Mexicans. A half-truth, but still, therefore, only half-true and half a lie. A tale that casts the Nortenos as victims, but doesn't acknowledge their participation in the rebellion and their dreams and hopes for freedom, and therefore falsely frames and omits the story of how those hopes and dreams were betrayed and crushed. The Nortenos remained in the United States, from Texas to California. 
Juan Seguin, upon returning to Texas, would become one of the first community organizers and leaders of Tejanos within the United States. In 1855... Okay, I think we're gonna leave this chapter uh, here. It's still a very long recording, uh, but you'll definitely have uh, that video coming up very soon, so stay tuned.